I was uh, very obedient as a child. My mother often told me that um, my little brother was way more to handle for her than my twin brother and myself combined. And I was lucky enough to be um, living in a very loving family. But I soon realized that uh, it was not love everywhere. There were countries who produced uh, weapons that uh, risked to uh, destroy all life on Earth. So that led me to my first civil disobedience action in 2005. We were a group of people uh, gathered to break into a, weapons, a nuclear weapons factory in England. Uh, as you can imagine, I was very nervous uh, for this first action, illegal action. Uh, I was also filled with doubts. Um, how can I think that a uh, few individuals like this could make any change uh, on these huge companies that create the most deadly weapons in the world? Wasn't that very naive? But since then, and since quite many nonviolent actions before that, after that, I've been more and more convinced of the power of nonviolence. And I hope to show you why during this presentation. So, uh, thousands of years we have um, uh, met conflict with either fight or flight. And that worked pretty well on the savannah when we met a lion. But in today's modern world, it doesn't work um, as well. So is there some other method we can use uh, when we face conflict today? Well, luckily there is. And sometimes it's called the third way, and sometimes it's called nonviolent, how to stay actively engaged when we face conflict. Um, so what is nonviolence? Um, well, um, there is a professor called Stella Wintagen, a Swedish professor, who says it has to be at least two components uh, for it to be nonviolence. So the first component is without violence. That's pretty obvious for most people. Uh, but he says that that's not enough. Um, there has to be another element, and that's against violence. So there has to be something working against violence or oppression or injustice. Otherwise, it, it's not nonviolence. But together, uh, it's nonviolence. So, like a walk in the park without you hitting anyone, it's not not violence. If you don't intervene, maybe, and stop violence that someone else might be doing. But another definition of nonviolence could be struggle against violence without the use of violence. In this uh, acclaimed book, this is an uprising. The authors, um, Mark and Paul Engler, uh, shows how success successful um, nonviolent actions uh, have been in the world so far. But they also point out that uh, the strategic application of nonviolence is quite poorly understood. And in this presentation, I hope to make you understand uh, maybe uh, nonviolence a little bit better, but primarily I hope to make you more interested in these methods uh, so that you will go and uh, find out more of your own. So um, I would like to bring up four different aspects of nonviolence that I think are key to understanding this concept. Um, and the first one is about the means and the ends. We in the animal rights movement, uh, we are here to work against the oppression and violence against animals. I think that's clear for, for all of us. Uh, for me, it doesn't make sense to use then the very methods that we are against, uh, that is violence. Um, and violence seldom uh, solves anything. It, it um, on the other hand, creates more conflict and pain. Another reason is that um, the state is often quite well prepared to handle violent uh, opposition. But on the other hand, creative nonviolent campaigns 
are much more difficult for them to control. The, seed, the, the means may be likened to a seed, the end to a tree. This is a quote of Gandhi, and he was convinced that uh, the, the means and ends are one and the same. They cannot be separated. So to create a nonviolent world, we need to use nonviolence. Uh, you will have seen many armed guerrillas that uh, have uh, had a good cause uh, in their struggle, maybe against a dictator of some kind. But uh, if they win their struggle, their fight, uh, many times they end up using the same oppression and violence uh, of the same uh, oppressor that they try to win over. And I think that's a risk actually in all struggles that we keep repeating the violence that we have used before. Uh, another reason um, for, uh, use, uh, for uh, using nonviolence is that um, it's more attractive for people to join a campaign. Research shows that nonviolent struggle um, creates um, more attractiveness, that draws more people to your cause, to your movement, than a violent one. So, <clears throat> do you have to be a pacifist or a saint to work with nonviolent actions? No. Would I kill Hitler if he was alive, if I could stop the Second World War? Could uh, violence be justified sometimes? We don't always have to agree on these issues. We can have different opinions on that. But it, it is enough to be um, in agreement about uh, the principles of a very action that we do together. That is enough. But uh, using um, violence, uh, uh, sorry, but not using violence doesn't mean that violence will not be used against us. And that leads us to uh, the second aspect of um, nonviolence, which is nonviolence exposes the violence. In 1963, there was something called the Birmingham Campaign in the US, uh, which was a struggle against the racial uh, segregation in that town. Uh, Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders, they were arrested for disobeying uh, rules that said that they were not uh, uh, allowed to demonstrate or um, boycott. And uh, when uh, King was in jail, he got a newspaper uh, with an article from eight uh, white pastors, and they criticized King and others for using uh, these confrontative methods like demonstrating and sit-ins. And uh, King, he um, began to write his response on small pieces of newspaper that that uh, he got, and then he smuggled out these, pe uh, these pieces. And that became the letter from the Birmingham uh, jail. And in that he says, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with. 40%, sorry, 47%. That is how many who want to ban slaughterhouses, according to an American poll. So that's really good news, isn't it? Uh, many are already on our side, almost the majority. Uh, the bad news is, of course, that they don't show this when they go to the supermarket or the restaurant. But with nonviolent um, actions, I believe that we can point to these internal conflicts that many people have when it comes to their behavior and their principles. Now, uh, in the animal rights movement, uh, violence against activists uh, is not very common, to my understanding. But it does happen. Here is an example from this very week where um, uh, people from Direct Action Everywhere did an open rescue of rabbits in Barcelona, Spain. 
uh, they got shot at, one of the cars got shot at, and uh, luckily the bullet didn't hit anyone, but uh, the glass hit one of the activists, as you can see here. In 1961, white and uh, black students uh, took a bus down in the deep south to challenge the segregation. They were stopped uh, by a mob of 200 uh, um, white people who um, uh, threw a bomb into the bus and they um, stood so they uh, couldn't get out. They blocked the doors. But finally, the activists came out, and when they came out, they got severely beaten by this mob. This is my friend Max, and last year he went into the Swedish forest together with other activists to try to stop um, a, a hunt going on. And his car was stopped by some hunters. They put lighter fluids around the car and tried to lit it on fire. They were also blocking the door so the activists couldn't get out. Finally, terrified of course, uh, scared for their own lives, they fled out of the car. And then they got beaten quite severely. Maybe you recognize that guy on the very left. That's the same guy. He, um, in, in spite of this terrible attack, he. Uh, came back to uh, uh, action together with myself and some others where we uh, formed the group The Chicken Inspection. We went into uh, a slaughterhouse and filmed and sent it live inside from the chicken uh, slaughterhouse. We did the same thing in August at another slaughterhouse where they kill pigs and cows. Um, yeah. Here is one of the pictures from there. And uh, last week we had the first trial for this chicken inspection. <clears throat> another one, another way to expose uh, the violence of the animal industry. So yeah, we have seen now that the Birmingham campaign and the Freedom Riders they exposed the violence of the apartheid system of that time in that place. Uh, now, animal rights activist tries to expose the animal industry um, and its violence. We don't create the tension or the violence, we animal rights activists. We just bring it in the open where it can be seen and dealt with. And uh, this connects us to the third aspect of uh, nonviolence, which is uh, political jiu-jitsu. You might have heard about this Japanese martial art, um, where it's designed to work against an oppressor that is both stronger and bigger than you. Um, and in jiu-jitsu you learn how to use the force of your opponent and turn it back on, on him or her. Uh, and the more power the opponent uses, the more he hits back. So, uh, nonviolence can work in this way. When peaceful activists are attacked uh, with repression, uh, this can create empathy from the public around. So those that before maybe were neutral, they can become supporters. And supporters can become activists because of this. And there is also a growing pressure, moral pressure from politicians to act when this happens. Uh, and the harder uh, the state hits us, the harder it hits them back. For instance, in possible loss of uh, credibility of voters um, and support from the public. And we call this effect political jiu-jitsu. This is a picture from... Um, Birmingham in 1963. Uh, how many have seen it before? Can I see a show of hands? Some of you at least. At that time it was extremely well-known picture. It was published in uh, most big newspapers in the US. Uh, and it had effect to really change the public perception of civil rights um, and also how the state 
um, took care, uh, uh, intervened and tried to stop these people trying to struggle for uh, their rights. Um, but it's not every time that um, uh, you have this empathy from the public. Um, it, um, um, it builds on that the public feel that uh, they are peaceful, the activists are peaceful, and that is not that is excessive force against them. So this is um, Bull Connor. He was the police chief in Birmingham at the same campaign I talked to you uh, talked about before, and um, he was. Uh, quite fierce in his um, actions against activists, so uh, he uh, used um, he called out the police to use dogs and these water houses, water hoses uh, on the activists, and he thought that he had um, um, backing by um, his um, public in the town, and for that he was probably right because there was that kind of sentiment that it was okay to treat uh, these activists in that way. But uh, they didn't feel the same in the White House or uh, most citizens of the North. They were shocked that the state would attack, uh, especially a peaceful youth, in this way. And that was enough for legislation to change at that time. I believe it uh, could be a similar situation for the animal rights movement. <clears throat> Many will think that the activists are themselves to blame if we go out in the forest and try to stop hunts, or if we go uh, unannounced uh, illegally into slaughterhouses or farms, even if we do it peacefully. Um, but there will be others that feel that um, it's uh, not uh, deserved that they will treat us uh, with physical violence or even legal repercussions. Uh, this is a list. Um, and that starts here, uh, you see, to number five, but it, can, it continues to over 800. And I can just uh, read some of them. Or I, I should say first that this was in reaction to a peaceful blockade that the Swedish group Empty Cages, where I'm myself uh, active, we, we did this. Uh, in about uh, an hour or so, the blockade uh, was on. And after that, Facebook was filled by these death threats, more than 800 of them. And it says, number one, die. Number two, please can someone uh, run them over. Number three, run them over, fucking idiots. And so it continues, so it continues. Obviously, these people uh, don't seem to be very empathetic towards our actions. Uh, but I. I want to think, and I know that some have reacted also to these comments and say, okay, these people, they uh, care for animals, they put themselves in harm's way, uh, sat on the, uh, on the ground and stopped these trucks uh, for a little time. Is it okay that we uh, think that they should be killed because of that? No, I think most citizens think uh, not. And maybe that will also get them to even come more over to our side. And I know for a fact there was one person because uh, that did just this, because I then met her in the same movement where I'm also active. Uh, so from being neutral, she has become an activist, partly by reading about this. We don't need everyone's uh, opinion to shift to be able to create a major change. It can be enough to um, change those that are still on the fence. Uh, if we can get neutral people to be supporters and supporters to be activists, that's a huge uh, uh, change. That could tip the scales in our favor. We can do three things to increase support and reduce hate from the public. Uh, firstly, we can refrain ourselves from using aggressiveness and hateful speech in our communication. Uh, because when people feel the hate uh, or when they hear hateful messages, 
they go in defense mode, and in that mode, you're not very likely to change your opinion. Secondly, we, uh, when we criticize the animal industry, and we should, we can direct our criticism against uh, the companies, the institutions, um, and not so much on the individual workers or consumers. Because if they feel that um, they are not attacked personally, they have also a, a bigger chance of going over to our side, or at least uh, being more positive to our message. And thirdly, we, we can use uh, symbols and uh, language that show very clearly that we are peaceful. Uh, like a friendly handshake, um, or um, uh, giving out cookies, or whatever uh, works uh, uh, in, your, in your culture, in your circumstances. Uh, Roger Hallam, <clears throat> he is one of the leaders of Extinction Rebellion. He says that also sacrifice is important. Uh, not important, it's necessary for winning the struggle. Uh, for the climate. If people see that other people are willing to sacrifice something in their lives, they might uh, think that this is a cause worth um, uh, thinking about and being active about. Um, and I think that uh, could mean the same in the animal rights movement. It could be smaller things, like um, Taking, uh, sacrificing your own comfort by standing a few hours in the freezing cold in a Swedish uh, winter, like Marisol here uh, outside of a slaughterhouse uh, in Uppsala with Uppsala Animal Save. Or it could be a bigger thing, like uh, be willing to take nonviolent action that might risk uh, you going to uh, prison or have other serious uh, ramifications. If, they see so, if pe people see something like that, people taking these kind of risks, uh, one might think, if she is risking all that, it might be something that I, I also should care about. I've seen that happening also, that kind of reaction. And um, coming to the fourth aspect of nonviolence, it's about separating the act and the actor. Uh, Nonviolence builds on the re, um, realization that we humans are complex. Uh, we are not either good or bad. We are both. We are both perpetrators and victims. All of us, I would say. Um, and nonviolent activists try to make this difference between the action and the actor. And it's possible to be deeply critical towards someone's behavior and still respect that person. It can be tricky, but it's possible. Uh, in the 80s, there were quite many actions against the nuclear weapons uh, bases. Uh, some European activists uh, went down there and did uh, actions like blockades uh, at the base. But they also invited some of the soldiers from the base to dinner. Um, and. Uh, it didn't mean that they had stopped struggling for their cause. It didn't mean uh, that they finally accepted uh, the base. It just me meant that we can meet over such basic things as food and drinks um, and relate to one another as human beings, even if we have different opinions. Uh, and uh, after the dinners they had, they didn't back down an inch. They continued as fiercely to struggle against this um, nuclear base. Uh, the well-known philosopher Arne Ness uh, from Norway, he was at an environmental action, and when the police came and carried him away, he gave friendly advice to the police how to hold him uh, to not strain their backs too much. If we treat um, uh, others, the opposition or people uh, at the places we work against um, respectfully, then there is a bigger chance that 
they might uh, someday agree with us or even change sides. Uh, for instance, uh, going from a worker uh, defending your company or institution to actually um, being a whistleblower like maybe Edward Snowden. Uh, I don't know how big that chance is, but uh, it's there. So now we have talked about these four aspects of uh, nonviolence, which I think are among the most important. Let's uh, move on to methods, nonviolent methods. Uh, this man, uh, he is not alive now, but when he lived um, in the 70s, he made a list, uh, his name is Jean Sharp, uh, of nonviolent methods that had been used before. And he came up with a list of 198 different methods that uh, had been used in different struggles to create a better society. You can look them up online, just uh, 198 methods, Gene Sharp, and you will find them all online. So, so to make it more uh, accessible, he um, uh, divided them into th three different categories, uh, all of these methods. So uh, number one, protest and persuasion, and number two, non-cooperation, and number three, intervention. Um, my guess is that most of the focus in the animal rights movement has been on this second category, non-cooperation, uh, namely to boycott animal products, or with other words, of course, uh, to make people go vegan. Uh, and the method is, of course, not a traditional boycott campaign because normally you have it at a specific company and a specific time frame. Uh, we in the animal rights movement uh, obviously want uh, everyone to do it all the time um, and uh, not specifically to a certain brand or, or anything like that. So, and for many, of course, it's a lifestyle also. But still, uh, well, thinking is, of course, um, behind this is that um, if everyone goes vegan, uh, there will be no more animal exploitation. And uh, I think it's really great uh, not to take part in this um, animal abuse uh, by being vegan. But I would argue that by focusing uh, almost solely maybe, uh, but very much on what not to do, we might miss uh, to focus on what we can do. Uh, that is to more actively be engaged uh, for animals with all these kind of different nonviolent methods that everyone can use. If we would be able to persuade just a, a fraction of the millions of vegans around the world uh, to become activists, we can do uh, a lot more, I believe. In the animal rights movement, uh, we have used uh, quite a lot of protest and persuasion as well, as most uh, other movements around the world on different issues does. We do marches, we do... Um, uh, we stand uh, on the squares and in cities to show signs and, and video, etc. Um, we don't do so much of uh, the method of intervention. Intervention is where you m more work more with your body to intervene in a place of, of violence. Um, that is uh, for us the animal industry, slaughterhouses, etc. We have uh, different examples of interventions, uh, and, it ha and it has begun, I believe, began to, to use, be used more today than before, like open rescues, um, blockades that I mentioned, and here you see an example of uh, meet the victims, uh, where you could say, I think, uh, it's some kind of limited occupation of a farm, where they go out and uh, witness, of course, uh, the situation for the animals. Um, another example of, um, of an intervention was in Australia, where they, in, uh, was it in April, I think, did a, a, a na na nationwide blockade of slaughterhouses and I think also farms. And that reached the front page of the New York Times, pretty impressive media coverage. Um, how many here feel uncomfortable with uh, being disobedient and making people angry? Can I see a show of hands? 
Okay, I would think it would be more interesting. I, I'm certainly one of those. I get very um, uh, annoyed or discomforted by, by that. I don't like to create conflict at all. But it's a shame that uh, we should uh, not use these powerful methods of intervention because we feel that. I think by supporting each other, but also with trainings, we can, if we feel that uh, uh, urge not to create conflict or make people angry, we can uh, uh, strengthen ourselves to be able to do that. Uh, as I said, Jean Sharp had these three uh, categories, but I think he missed one that is uh, important. And uh, you can call that the constructive program. That's the name uh, Gandhi used. And that is all about creating the world we want to see, creating the alternative. Um, all these others are, of course, resistance to something bad, and that's uh, very important. But I think it's also important to show what we want instead. Animal sanctuaries uh, is um, one of the methods to do this. Uh, here we sh uh, can see how animals from the industry are supposed to live as unique um, individuals and how they should be taken care of with love and, and respect. Of course, uh, to uh, create and support uh, plant-based food uh, is an important way to show, yes, there is an uh, alternative, not only viable, but also delicious. And we see more on that. Uh, and maybe not everyone can start their own companies, but those uh, that don't can support other companies. And of course, th small things also, like asking your store to uh, stock up on vegan products. Uh, that's also part of the constructive program. And we have quite exciting technologies uh, where you have a clean meat, uh, actual meat, but not uh, using actual animals. Uh, that could be, uh, I mean, we don't know where it will go, but it could be a real game changer if that really happens. I think at least interesting to explore where it takes us. So now we have talked about uh, these different methods um, of nonviolence. But some words about how, we d how do we do it. I hear some activists uh, that say, oh, I'm here for the animals, not for people. I don't like people. <laughs> um, but sorry to say, there is no way around it. We have to have the people with us. That, that's just a fact to me, at least. Uh, we need both people as supporters, but as I said before, also as activists. We need to be a lot more than we are today. Uh, and to make that happen, I think we need to learn more about and think more about human psychology, uh, what affects people, uh, what makes people um, change behavior, but also to stay active in a sustainable way. We also need to uh, learn more about how societies change, because that's something else. We can't just focus on the individual, we have to also focus on institutions, laws, uh, companies, how do they change? That's an, another kind of dynamic. Um, I think we need more trainings. Um, in, in a non-violence training, you talked about strategies, you talk about strat uh, methods that you can use. You try out different things and see if they can work in, in the real world. With role plays like here, you see, you try out a different way of acting and see what happens when they're met maybe with violent uh, repression. And then you can adjust uh, your actions accordingly. This is from a training I facilitated in Copenhagen with uh, direct action everywhere. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like uh, this little kid, very small and in insignificant, when I stand beside a huge slaughterhouse with a million dollar budget and uh, the law totally on their side. Other times I feel like a prophet in the wilderness, in the desert, shouting out a message that no one wants to hear. They just want to keep on eating their meat. 
Uh, and all this is true. I mean, they have um, the money on their side. Uh, they have the law on their side. We have a majority that still eats meat uh, and uh, wants to keep on doing that <laughs> for the most part. At the same time, I think we should not forget uh, the possibilities. We should remember what has happened before. We should think about that in history, few had thought that slavery would uh, be banned. Few had thought that women would get their rights. Even fewer, I think, would uh, have thought that a woman could marry a woman. Now, uh, in most countries in the world, at least in, in many countries, this is things we take for granted. But we should also remember that this was fierce struggles to get these rights uh, that we have today. And when it comes to animals uh, and the animal rights movement, I do feel hopeful. I see small signs, at least, that we're going in the right direction. Uh, here uh, is outside of a slaughterhouse in Linköping in Sweden. Uh, when we came there, it was quite uh, ac uh, ac accessible. But now they're putting up fence, they put sign after sign uh, that we shouldn't be there, that we're not welcomed. Uh, this could be a bit offsetting, but I see something positive. We matter, and they care about us being there. And also from companies, as you maybe have seen, this is Burger King saying on a Swedish subway, if you like chicken, you go for one burger. If you like chickens, you go for the plant-based burger, of course, uh, for the new plant-based alternative. Things, uh, I think that was pretty... Uh, courageous of them <laughs> to make that distinction so clear. But I'm also very aware about the enormous suffering that is happening all the time, as I'm sure you all are. I mean, we, we can't stand on the side and waiting for change to happen. We have to act now, because every day we wait, there is this enormous suffering happen all the day. So, the sooner it comes, uh, the better, of course, it is for all animals and for the day we will uh, reach our goal of uh, total animal liberation. The environmental activist um, Bill McKibben said this, nonviolent protest movements, maybe the greatest invention of the 20th century, is our biggest hope to confront what threatens our very existence. And um, in other movements, like Extinction Rebellion, I see um, hope and inspiration uh, to take the urgency seriously. This is for the climate that I th think is uh, among the biggest challenges we also have, together with the animal oppression. Um, and, um, but they show the possibility of creating a radical mass movement, and I think that's something we need for animals as well. It always starts small. Every mass movement starts small. It can start with us. Um, but without us and many others, it, it won't be possible. Lastly, I would like you uh, briefly to imagine that you're around 70, year, uh, 70, 80 years old. Maybe some of you are already, I don't know. Mostly are, I see you, you're younger than that. But in the future, when you have reached that age, uh, and your grandkids will ask you, or maybe your siblings' grandkids will ask you, how did you ban the slaughterhouses? How did you create this vegan world that we are now living in? You can say you were a part of that. Uh, with your actions, with your sacrifice, together we made it happen. Without weapons, without much power or money, but, without, but with radical uh, non-violent actions. And together, I strongly believe that that can happen. Thank you so much for listening.